Kelly Taylor. And I'm Marissa Polowitz. Welcome to this week's edition of Concordia Reports. And on this week's show, Concordia's amateur radio station gets its wings. Also, the whole bunch of people that post to the site regularly linked up. After a year of online chatting, Habs fans from across North America finally connect in person. And later on, Many Mara shows us why we should save the chimps. Today we come to you from Concordia's Engineering and Visual Arts Building. And as usual, Marissa, I'm pretty hungry. Well, don't worry, Kelly, because there are plenty of options for cheap food right around the corner. In fact, we asked what you do when you're downtown and need to grab a cheap bite fast. Well, I go to the Frigo Ver because it's right there. For students, 350 gets you a roti that's like potatoes and stuff. Tasty, healthy. Anti-capitalist, they claim, but I don't really understand that myself, actually. The Express, Al Tayeb, on the corner of uh, Makai and uh, Maisonneuve, because it's healthy. It's something we know because it's Middle Eastern. So don't worry, Kelly. We'll make this quick so you can go grab a bite to eat. That sounds good, but we're not done with food yet. How would you feel if you got a D on your report card? Well, that's the grade Quebec schools got on their food. That's why two moms took it upon themselves to provide a healthy alternative to unhealthy vending machines and cafeteria food. Amri Moga reports. Welcome to Kids Lunch. This is where sisters Michelle and Suma Her prepare lunches for their clientele. Having kids of their own, both sisters know how dreadful the early morning rush before school can be, which is exactly why they decided to relieve parents from the daily task. People love the idea because most parents or carers hate making lunches. So we provide that service, which is great for them. And that it's uh, organic and fresh and healthy is just a bonus. Indeed, healthy food in schools is becoming a major concern for our province. A report done by the Center for Science in the Public Interest has given Quebec a whopping D for its school nutrition. Prime Minister Jean Charest has announced that Quebec schools will eliminate soft drinks and fatty foods starting next January. While the government has paid attention to the cautionary advice, there is still much progress to be made. That's why some parents prefer to trust kids' lunch for their child's nutrition. Orchard House is a center for early childhood development. It's also the first school to work with the kids' lunch program. Jessica Benna, the administrative assistant, says the school is using kids' lunch as an educational tool. So we're teaching them about, you know, um, having a well-balanced diet, the different food groups, the four-year-olds. They, they actually talk about that in their science um, activities, about what types of foods do you need to have, and they do the food pyramid um, and things like that. And so the kids' lunch actually really promotes that um, through their lunch hour. For Concordia Reports, I'm Amri Moga. You can see the full report on school food in Canada at www.cspinet.org. Sorry guys. Well, it's official. Technology is now an integral part of university life. But are cell phones and laptops more of a distraction than a help in class? Nyla Jenna finds out. Sorry. Roam the halls of any university and chances are you'll see more screens than pen and paper. The redesigned mezzanine in Concordia's hall building is a perfect case. Whether students like it or not, technology surrounds them. Laptops can be a valuable tool for students. I'll write little notes along with what I'm seeing on the overhead just to help me out when I go back home to study some more. But also for teachers. Concordia University Vice Provo Dr. Danielle Marin studies technology integration in classrooms. She's also a math professor. I want them to apply what I'm doing immediately. They have the software so they can apply it. If that's what they're doing, then it's great because we have full use of the technology if it's used for something else. No, I don't let students talk in the class. I don't let them talk between themselves. We talk together. But talking is no longer the issue. When students can connect to the Internet, modern-day doodling often takes over. Not that I go on MSN, but I will, like, surf and stuff. Maybe play a little music just a little bit. There's more temptation, let's say that. There's more temptation to be going away from the, your main preoccupation and do something else, yes. This year, Concordia's Liberal Arts College has come up with a policy regulating the use of laptops in classes. If you're caught browsing in class, they will remove your laptop privileges. The policy addresses the possibility of laptops disturbing the classroom environment. So when does technology become a hindrance? I think when it becomes unacceptable, if it starts disturbing other students, 
because you might a student might make the decision to waste his time or her time in the classroom by listening to music and chatting on the but I think if it becomes disturbing or distracting to other students, that should be not that's that's not right. Some quick classroom tips: no iPods, no chatting, and no constant texting. For Concordia Reports, I'm Nyla Jenna. It seems like we could all learn a thing or two about tech etiquette. I know, but imagine a classroom full of kids with laptops. The Eastern Township School Board recently bought laptops for all of its students. We'll bring you their take on technology integration in the classroom next time on Concordia Reports. But now back to today's show. 18 to 24 year olds are more open to different lifestyles. Those are the results of a recent Leger marketing poll on reasonable accommodation. But we wanted to know what you think. Yeah, I think that we are more accommodating because we realize that multicultural is something that's a part of our society and it's like there's nothing wrong with wearing your, your headpiece or carrying around something if it's a part of your culture. And I find that the older people don't really believe in that because they maybe weren't brought up in that way, but everyone has a right to their own culture. Uh, I don't think we're more accommodating uh, per se. I think perhaps we're more accommodating to this generation's uh, immigrants. You know, 40 years ago, the, the young people of that day would have been just as accommodating with the uh, the immigrants of those days. So. Yeah, I think that 18 to 24 year olds, especially uh, here in Montreal, we work in Cordia students, uh, we see a lot of diversity everywhere. We've grown up, like we've been ingratiated in that, you know, like environment. Those are some really interesting perspectives. Definitely. Up next, Montreal goes high fashion. But first, let's take a break. Welcome back everyone to Concordia Reports. Changes in the airwaves all over Concordia's Loyola campus. CJLO, the university's independent radio station, is nearing its 10 year anniversary, but it still doesn't have a place on the radio dial. Lindsay Wood finds out when that's going to change. The CC building at the Loyola campus is where the student radio station has been for almost 10 years. It plays home to over 30 student DJs and almost 100 volunteers. The plan was for the station to go on air in 2005. Two years and many station managers later, one is finally getting the ball rolling. Chris Quinnell has been at CJLO for seven years. He started off as a DJ and worked his way to the top. Chris has one of only two paid positions as the station manager. After setbacks, like having the land they had intended to set up the antenna on get sold to someone else, and managers before Chris quitting on a regular basis, plans that had once been ideas and dreams are finally starting to form into a reality. Every step of the way, people have been saying, oh yeah, we're going to be up on the air next spring. Now we're going to be next fall, and the next spring. And it's been yo-yoing back and forth like that since we started the whole thing, kind of underestimating how long this whole process would take. How do you think your listeners feel about the long-time talk of the station going AM? Frustrated. And I definitely sympathize with them because it's been a long process. I mean, the biggest setback was the land being pulled out from under our feet last, last September. We would have been up on the air then if things had gone through the way they're supposed to. But, um, you know, all I can just ask is that people remain patient, listen online when uh, they have the chance, and we're almost there. We'll be up this fall. The station's music library has enough CDs to satisfy even the biggest music lovers. It houses 12,000 CDs and 9,000 records, a ton of music that is just dying to be played. Behind me is the land intended for the antenna. CGLO currently allows 25 listeners to stream online. That is the maximum amount that can listen to any given show at any time. When CJLO goes AM, that number becomes infinite. Marissa? Lindsay, if they put the antenna in West Lachine, what will happen to the radio station at Loyola campus? The station's going to stay right where it is. The antenna will be used to broadcast from Lachine, but the DJs will still be able to call the CC building their home. Well, I will be sure to tune in when they do set the date in stone, but for now, they seem to be on the right track. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Happy listening, Concordia. For now, you can catch CJLO on www.cjlo.com. But if you're listening to 95.9 FM, you've probably heard commercials for Shave to Save on Mix 96. And that's just one of the many annual fundraising and awareness campaigns for breast cancer during the month of October. But this year, one thing has changed. In a complete reversal, the Canadian Cancer Society has changed one key point in their message to women, particularly regarding breast self-exams. 
André Beaulieu of the Canadian Cancer Society explains. We are changing our message to from f promoting breast self-examination to know your breasts, which means that we're broadening our message in general. The main method of detection they are now concentrating on is mammography. However, mammograms are generally not recommended for women under 40. Beaulieu says this is why it's important for young women not to misunderstand. I said they thought that we were saying to them, well, just simply don't do anything, which is not what at all what we are saying. And that's a problem. About 5,000 young women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year alone. And this cancer tends to be more aggressive in women aged 18 to 40. We went to the Hall building to find out if young women were even concerned about breast cancer at all. Here's what you told us. Honest answer is no, I don't worry about it. It's nothing that's on my priority list to do. We never have a huge discussion about it, but I think it's in the back of everyone's mind. My doctors never talk to me about it. Never talk to me about it, yeah. We'll be right back. Well, the puck has dropped on another season in the NHL, and here in Montreal, the Gazette-run website HabsInsideOut.com is celebrating. Nyla Jinna joins us from the Bell Centre with more. Nyla? Thanks, Kelly. And one short year, HabsInsideOut.com has grown from a Montreal Gazette blog and news site to a full-blown community. This time tomorrow, 50 to 70 Habs Inside Out members will congregate to the Bell Centre for a full day of activities to celebrate the site's first year. But how does the website create so much buzz? I sat down with Habs Inside Out blogger and Montreal Gazette City columnist Mike Boone for an inside look. So Mike, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. This is the first time I've been on YouTube. I'm kind of excited. <laughs> Tell me, how was Habs Inside Out created? Who had the first idea? The idea began with Gazette Editor-in-Chief Andrew Phillips. Uh, he went off to a conference in the U.S., kind of your typical, the internet is killing us, what are we going to do about it, uh, conference of editors and publishers. And he came back with an idea based on a site that's done for the Seattle Seahawks. A guy, he doesn't even live in Seattle, and he created this comprehensive website dedicated to the Seahawks that had everything, uh, archived interviews, um, basically anything you would want to know about the Seahawks was there, including a blog, you know, with fans' comments, etc. Andrew came back and said, well, if they did that for the Seattle Seahawks, what could we do for the Montreal Canadiens? And um, it kind of got entrusted to people in the office who were very interested in the internet, which was uh, Sid Banerjee, David Stubbs, and I, interested in the internet and passionate about the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, he just said, check out the Seattle site and tell us you know, the degree of adaptability and what you can come up with for Montreal. I think it took us about 10 days kicking around ideas. We went to exactly one expense account lunch at a lousy restaurant. And uh, basically, that's what you have now on Habs Inside Out is many of the ideas we had originally with some embellishments since. Right. I was taking a look at the website yesterday, and the first post dates back to, you know, end of September, September 30th. But it took a while for people to really get into it. I think it was only by mid-November that people started actually commenting or stuff other than spam links, you know. But as soon as it, as soon as it got rolling, it just, it just kept going and just kept going out. But the site has changed a lot since then. We've added a lot of stuff. David Stubbs came up with the idea of doing audio, which I think is quite brilliant. Um, he got this terrific digital recorder with which he's able to go into scrums in the dressing room and pick up everything. You, you get not only the player talking, but you can hear tape being peeled off stockings in the background. Anyway, that's been a very popular feature. And, uh, you know, we just, we, I can only speak for myself, I steal shamelessly. You know, I routinely quote and I, and I give credit to all the people that know more about hockey than I, which is like most of the people on the beat. We're always thinking of ways to make it better because uh, we really care about it. We, it's our baby, you know, based on Andrew's idea. We pretty much invented it. No, no consultants came in and told us how to design a website. So we, we take a great deal of pride in it and we're, uh, you know, we're always kind of touching it up and a little flourish here and a little trim there. There must have been a lot of technical concerns about how to get the site running, how to, you know, upload the audio, stuff like that. There was a guy in our office named John McFarlane who was a reporter and a copy editor and also a, a real um, 
internet computer buff. And he was kind of our link to some outside people who did all the technical aspects of the site. We didn't do it through the newspaper chain. We were, um, well, we didn't want to for a variety of reasons. We just wanted to make it as simple as possible for people to comment on it. We didn't, we didn't want their name, rank, serial number, their whole biography for them to sign in. We wanted them to just, you know, get an identity and, and start posting. And that's worked out really well. We get more posts than any other site on the paper. Lots of people know you from your email in the uh, red line on Saturday's Gazette. Um, so your blog has sort of like a personal touch to it. It's more like an opinion rather than a straight out game story. Yeah, very much so. The, the parts where I'm not stealing other people's opinions are my own. It's, um, yeah, it's kind of just what, I, what I've always tried to do. I think this is about my eighth season with Red uh, for the Saturday piece. And it's just, you know, to, uh, to throw in a little bit of humor, try to be as outrageous as possible. And uh, it's not, it's the furthest thing from straight reportage. However, I, I would make the distinction with my game blogs in which I try to be a little bit opinionated during the game, but then at, at you know, at midnight, like it's a Cinderella story, the carriage becomes a pumpkin. I, I go down to the dressing room and try to be um, an ordinary journalist. Now, on Saturday, there's going to be uh, a sort of reunion of sorts for the regular posters on HabsInsideOut.com. How did that get started? What, what's happening? They started it. A whole bunch of people that post to the site regularly linked up through email, and uh, we were kind of presented with a fait accompli. They told us, we've been talking about this. I think that it's about 40 or 50 of them, very far flung, a guy from Pennsylvania at least one person from Newfoundland, um, plus people in Montreal. And they said, we'd like to get together and go to a game. They, they picked out the October 20th game against Buffalo. I think Stubbs helped them in lining up a block of tickets, but it was their baby. I mean, they just said, you know, we want to do this. And, and we said, yeah, great, you know, we'll, we'll make it as much fun as possible. I think the plan is to take the people to a morning skate then we're going to have lunch with them, they're going to go to the game, and we're going to try to hook up with them afterwards as well. It sounds like a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it will be, you know. We, we tried to arrange for them to skate during the warm-ups, but the Canadians said no. <laughs> I'm sure they did. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It was my pleasure. You can read Mike Boone's blog at HabsInsideOut.com. Now to arts and culture. Montreal might be most famous for its summer festivals, but the fall is also quite exciting. The 8th biannual Montreal Fashion Week was held at Marché Bon Secours last week. The show was a perfect opportunity for local designers to strut their stuff on the runway. And in the movies, the 36th annual Nouveau Cinema Festival is currently running here in Montreal. Independent films are being screened mainly at Eccentris and Imperial Cinemas. Student tickets are only $8. The festival runs through October 21st. For more information, visit their website at www.nouveaucinema.ca. It's almost time to say goodbye, but first, we have one last thing to show you. Chimpanzees are the animals that most closely resemble you and I, but their survival is threatened by ongoing human activity like drug testing. This has led to a massive decline in the chimp population across the world. With a very special report, Mehdi Mara with Save the Chimps. Some chimps are swinging from a vine, some chimps in jack boots. Chimps end up in the hands of humans after the mother chimp has been taken to a laboratory or been killed. While doing this documentary, I went to Quebec City to find out with Martin Bushman, who has worked as a volunteer with chimps in Africa. Very adorable, and one of the problems of the chimpanzee is that they are so adorable that everybody wants one. Every white people in Africa that has ever seen a chimpanzee wants to own one. Laboratory experiment has heightened the alarm of the threat. Experiment with animal on, on one side but I'm totally uh, against it. While the adult chimps sit and watch the trees fall by, the baby chimps are exploring their new environment while the teenagers fly atop of the trees to touch the sky. Cara Barbola Lund is an animal rights activist and I went to speak with her from her home in Laval and this is what she has to say. With this, even if they're the animals that look the most like us, you know, but I know we can think, you know, it's like the law of the jungle, you know, the stronger, you know, can do whatever you do, you know, just to get alive. But we're humans, so why do we act like animals? At the turn of the last century, an estimated one million chimps live in the wild, but today only 200,000 of them is left. The threat is real. 
Uh, some people say that in 20 years, chimpanzees in the wild will be extinct. Uh, there will still be chimpanzees in zoos and in laboratories, but you won't see them in the wild anymore. Uh, and if that happens, I think it's big, big loss for the when nothing else matters. for the human species because we're going to have uh, just basically uh, murdered our closest cousin, and it's not a good sign of where we're going. It's just a prayer for the dying. Like many other places on planet Earth, we humans need to preserve our natural environment so that the chimps can survive. I know it's going to sound extreme, but uh, who created the, the bad situation for the, the chimpanzees? It's not elephants, it's not climate change, it's, uh, it's human. It's just a prayer for the dying. Trees are being cut in there uh, every day. We see big trucks, big truckload of, uh, of huge trees being taken out of the forest. And the law is not enforced. Governments in those African countries don't take responsibility to crack down on poachers to protect the lives of the chimps. On one hand, the government of Guinea the African country where this documentary was filmed says there is not much money to sponsor wildlife programs, but according to Kara, money is not the only problem. I think money is not the only way we can help them. It would be more like uh, with talking to people in the school, uh, in the college and everything, like just to sensibilize them about the chimps and what's happening with them. Because, you know, every time you give money to something or an organism, you know, maybe like not even a half of it is going to go there. This solar-powered electric enclosure was funded by the European Union. The chimps will be released into a temporary enclosure until they get used to nature, before they are permanently released to the wild. For Concordia Report, I'm Medimara. If you want to help save orphan chimps, you can make a donation by calling 416-987 3711. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marissa Polowitz. And I'm Kelly Taylor. Be sure to join us on November 9th for the next edition of Concordia Reports.